So the next talk is uh, with from Nicola Mattia, and he's going to be talking about testing for and deploying to AWS environments. Thank you. Hi, everyone again. So I learned an important life lesson at NixCon this year. If you're going to a conference and aim at giving a talk, it's a good idea. But aim at only one. The consequence is this one's going to be much shorter. So feel free to interrupt, ask questions during the talk, share your experience, and hopefully we'll make it to half an hour. So I did, during most of my career, I had someone dealing with the deployment for me, and I didn't have to care about it at all, until I started this side project called DeckDeckGo, which is a presentation software. And then all of a sudden, I was alone to do my deployments. I had to actually deal with uh, setting up Postgres and everything. And I had to learn about it. So really liking Nix, I tried to push as much of the complexity inside of Nix. And I didn't really want to use Docker-based software for building, for deploying. Thank you very much. <laughs> And yeah, so this is the story of my journey working or making Nix work for AWS. So first a bit about DeckDeckGo, which is the presentation software that I'm actually using today. So the front end is Web Components and TypeScript. Web Components is a new standard in the W3C for basically creating new HTML tags that have some JavaScript logic in them. I have no idea what it, how it actually works. So this is not my job. My job is the rest, the back end. So the back end was entirely written in Haskell. And for the deployment and the build, we used Nix. And actual pushing the artifacts, starting these three servers, it's all Terraform. I never quite understood Nix ops, so no Nix ops there. From AWS, we're using AWS Lambda, which is basically you push some code, and it runs somewhere, you don't have to create a machine, you don't have to set anything up, it's just your code is there, and whenever there's a request arriving, it's being run. S3 for storing presentations, SQS, which is a queue service from Amazon that we use for different lambdas to talk with each other, DynamoDB for, we actually got rid of that, but at the beginning we used it, and the setup in Nix is kind of interesting, so we decided to share it, and RDS, which is the relational database service of Amazon. So, if you want to check out DeckDeckGo, it's fully open source, it's on GitHub, deckgo slash deckdeggo. Uh, it's a whole bunch of JavaScript, so that might be a bit scary, but there's some Haskell and some Nix. All the code I'm going to show during the presentation can be found in this directory here. So feel free to have a look. Now, as I said, I didn't have much time to prepare this talk, so I'm missing one slide, which is the last one. And it's actually quite convenient because I can show you how DeckDeckGo works. You have a set of templates. You can select one. Going to have a last thank you. Uh, no. <laughs> and there you go. So. The first part is going to be the actual Lambda part. So I have this Haskell code, and this Haskell code needs to run somewhere in AWS. And for this, Lambda is great, because Lambda is really just this abstraction. You don't have to start the server. You don't have to stop it. The problem is that when you build stuff in Nix, most of the time you need a Nix store. Or if you use Nix OS, it's very simple. You just copy the closures, activate, and that's it. On Lambda, you have very limited size. I think the what you push to AWS can only be 50 megabytes, so you can't fit in their Nix store most of the time. You can't have the GHC closure with it. So the answer here is to use fully static Haskell executables, where there's no dynamic linking at all. You don't even have an interpreter bundled in your executable. And there's one guy here, Niklas, where is he? Over there. Big applaud for him, who made amazing work on getting this to work. It's kind of a very nice project because it's Nix 
and yet it allows projects to live outside of the Nick story. So you have these standalone artifacts and it's using CacheX, so it's really a lot of the community coming together on this one. There's a funding page somewhere you can find it on, a, on the GitHub project, nh 2 static Haskell Nix, and so feel free to chip in there. Now, so we build these Haskell executables, and we just put them in a zip file, and the zip file is sent to AWS, and just works. The actual upload is done with Terraform. So how does this static Haskell Nix work in practice? Most of you do Haskell here, and this is using the legacy Haskell platform, not the new Haskell. And I just want to show you how it works or how you can make your any executable static, pretty much any. So this static Haskell Nix thing is basically just where the Nicholas's project is, and there's a survey directory, which you can just import, passing it your normal packages. In this case, my normal packages are just Nix packages with some overlays adding DecDegos custom packages. And then this is crazy because line 16, you can see, just do survey dot packages with static Haskell binaries dot Haskell packages, and there you go. You have your Haskell packages that actually compile to static, fully static executables. This is beautiful. And then when you create your Lambda, you just copy an executable, for instance, this one. There are a few bugs, right? So might might break at times. Just copy the executable, zip it up, and that's it. Any questions on this? Great. And then the next question is, OK, we have some stuff that's being built with Nix, but how do we teach Terraform to reuse that? And on the left, there's a weird thing. So this function handler path, path equals built-in seek, something, and then the function.zip. The idea is that Terraform has this data external resource, or it's not a resource, it's actual data, where you can tell it, hey, Terraform, just run this command, and you can expect this command to output JSON. And then you can use this JSON in Terraform as well. So line three to nine, this part here, are just the Lambda description. And the file name is the zip file that's expected by AWS. And here, this file name refers to data external build function result path, which is defined line 12 to 19. And most of the time in Terraform, you have to say, oh, Terraform, please recreate this resource if the file hash has changed, for instance, or if the time of the day is later than something like that. So we have weird ways of making sure that Terraform notices when your code changes. And next, it's not a problem, because the entire file name is going to change whenever you change code. So how this work is that we do a Nix evil. It's basically going to evaluate something and tell Nix to actually print the output as JSON. So this is very, very cool, very convenient, because you don't have to have any other commands that you run. Just call Nix, output JSON, and that's it. The weird part, which is here. So this is just to make sure that your function is actually being built. It's like a deep seek. Because this is just an evil, right? Nix will try not to do any build. And this one will give you a path back, but the path might not exist yet. So you just do a bit of a dirty trick here to make sure. It's basically import from derivation to make sure that the thing exists. Now I'm going to go into the AWS services themselves. So Lambda for running the code. And now we'll talk about S3 and the rest. So the talk is deploying to AWS, but also testing for AWS. So I think this is the interesting part, because when you ship some code, you deploy, you don't want to run, you don't always want to run a staging environment where you run your integration tests. So what we're going to do here is just for each and every AWS service, we're going to try and find either an open source alternative or some jars provided by AWS, some form that we can execute the services locally inside our Nix build. And then we just redirect the URLs during the tests to the local servers, and we repeat for the next service. So we're going to do this for, for a few services. First one is S3. So you probably all came across Minayo, who's seen it before. 
Okay, so Minio is an open source clone of AWS S3. It has its own protocol, but it also speaks S3 protocol. And it's a nice project. Works for my use case, which is testing. I heard people say that it was working great if you use it as a full replacement in production. I heard some people say that it wasn't that great if you used it as a full replacement in production. So it depends a lot. But for testing, it works just fine. And how this looks is very simple. You add MinIO as an input to your derivation. You set some domain environment variables because it requires them. And you start the server. You say localhost 9000 for the port. Give it a temporary directory where you can actually store its artifacts. And that's it. It's running, and you run your integration tests. The last thing you need to do is actually tell your code to use localhost as opposed to a canonical AWS URL. In the case of Haskell, I'm using um, Amazonka. And you can give your own HTTP manager to Amazonka and just tell it, hey, listen, if you see S3 Amazon AWS.com, well, just redirect your local one. Disable HTTPS, and that works. Make sure to only use that during your tests and not in production, of course. Next one. Oh, questions about S3? All right. Next one is the simple queue service. So this is just for sending messages between lambdas using AWS. It's, a, it's an AWS project, works fine on their server. But for this one, they, they don't provide artifacts, or they don't provide a way of running it locally unless you use Docker. But there is an alternative one, which is Elastic MQ. Very much like MinIO, it's a, an open source clone. But it speaks the SQS protocol. So what we do is that we just grab the artifacts that they release on GitHub. It's a jar. We just Java it, and it runs. So I feel a bit dirty inside for starting Java on my laptop, but as long as I don't have to start Docker, right? <laughs> Wash, rinse, repeat, just as we did for S3. Replace the host, replace the port, disable SSL, and we're good to go. DynamoDB, who's here has heard of it? Yeah, for the others, it's basically like Redis. It's a very simple table format database. And on this one, AWS is actually pretty cool because they do provide ways of running it locally. You can download the jar, which you can just start on your laptop. By the way, all these services, even though they use network, they never require anything like sudo or... So that means that everything can just run derivation. It's actually very nice to have your tests running, fully sandboxed, if someone else in your company has run the test before, they're going to be cached in your shared cache if you have one. You don't even have to run the test yourself. So here you just grab any of those tarballs. You unpack it in your derivation. And you just say, OK, Java start. You have some options to set, the port. And after that, you're in your integration tests. and. You don't forget to tell Amazonka to use your local version of DynamoDB. Questions for this one? Great. Now what about Postgres? So Postgres is actually interesting because the exact same Postgres, or mostly the same Postgres, is going to be running on AWS. And for many, many years in my life, I thought, OK, I have tests that run Postgres, so that means I need to install Postgres on my laptop. I need to install it through Ubuntu or a service, service in XOS. But you really don't have to do that. And this was a eureka moment for me. Postgres can use any kind of directory, and it runs as a background process if you want to, but it doesn't have to be a system-wide background process. That means that you can even start Postgres in your Nix shell, or you can start Postgres inside a derivation and just kill it at the end, and you don't have to tamper with your system-wide Postgres. So you just tell Postgres, hey, just initialize the database in PG data. This is just a name I give it. You have some uh, configuration to set. 
but that's that's about it. Then you tell it, all right, start, and from there on, you have Postgres started. You just make sure that before you do anything else, you give it enough time. Then you create the databases you're going to need for your tests, and that's it. Run your tests. At the end, you say, all right, immediate stop, and no traces left of Postgres in your system. Everything clear here? The really cool part about that is that so all these services are provided through Nix and they can be started and stopped at will. All these services so far have used temporary directories, so they're not going to write anywhere else than in your temporary directory folder. So you can go one step further with this is say, well, I'm going to have an, a shell wrapper that's actually going to start my services whenever I develop locally. So if I don't want to do a full Nix build for my thing, maybe I have. I'm using GHCI for development, but I still need the services to be there. So this is something I find very, very, very valuable, is to have those small shell wrappers that gets initiated in a shell hook, and it just creates a few functions that you can call from your shell, from your command line. So here I have one. Oh, is it big enough? Say something. Sorry? So, this one is for loading Postgres, very simple. And this is where the heavy lifting happens. This function is store services in terms of UX. If you have coworkers that don't reuse really Nix or don't know about Nix, they don't want to set anything up, you just tell them, well, enter the Nix shell, and when you want to start your services or when you want to run your tests, just call store services. It's going to load Postgres. It's going to start SQS as well. It's going to start S3. And then anything that happens after that is going to have access to all these services. And when they're done, they just call stop services. And everyone's going to thank you for this because most companies now still do, OK, you want to run the tests, or you need Postgres. Just do sudo apt install Postgres. And uh, with this, no need for that. People don't even need to know that Postgres exists. You might want to add a few things like a few REPLs, that set environment variables. Here, we actually need our tests to use some JavaScript built stuff. So set an environment variable where there's some built JavaScript that was built by Nix. If you forget how you actually did the packaging, you don't have to, to worry about it. I'm using this once a month. We started working in, in April, I think. One day I packaged it, and now I don't have to, to worry about it anymore. I actually forgot how it, how it works. And that's it. Thank you for listening. Do you have any questions or experience reports that uh, you want to share? So uh, are you aware of uh, Nix OS testing suite when it uh, spawns uh, QMO machine and you can use actually Nix description language to start the services inside? And if yes, why didn't you use it? So first of all, I'm not using Nix OS in productions, right? So for a Nix OS test, means I would have to set to create a new Nixos module with my code and then ship that and do a full Nix build. The other problem is that Nixos tests only run on Linux, as far as I know. They could run on Darwin, for instance, but no. So I'm using Linux, but the, the friend I'm working with on this one uses Darwin. So it wasn't really an option. And also, it doesn't allow you to do the local development, right? If I use GHCI to test my code, I also have unit tests, unit tests that run again Postgres. So in that case, that would mean, OK, I'm in GHCI, I make a change, then I close GHCI, I do Nix build, then it has to build everything, actually rebuild from scratch the whole library, the Haskell library, and then start the tests. It would take probably a minute for everything to happen. Whereas if I just do, if I just start Postgres in the background or anything like that, I just do colon error, reload GHCI, main, runs the test, and I'm good. Iteration cycle is about five seconds. Yeah. Thanks. 
Um, did you look at terror test? At? Terror test. Terror test, no, what is it? Uh, it's um, a framework uh, wrapped around Terraform to do integration testing. So it spins up components, runs a, a test cycle and destroys those components. It's a little bit like in-spec and server-spec, but baked with support for um, Terraform. Very nice. So I'm guessing this is also something that takes some time to run, right? But this is, I didn't know about this, and this is great. Boss, it, it, it has some, notes? some overlap. <laughs> Thank you very much. I also want to make another tooling suggestion, which is uh, Terranix. I don't know if the Terranix author is here today, but it's a really cool way to write Terraform the syntax in Nix instead. And it does away with all the horrors you have to go through when you realize that the Terraform language itself can't do all kinds of stuff. You can write it in Nix instead, and I find it very convenient. So that might also be something that's useful. Yeah, although if the goal is really to hide Nix from your coworkers so they don't hate you, this is a bad move. <laughs> I have a question. Uh, do developers use uh, these services started from Nix Shell for local development or only for test running? You mean these? Yes. Yeah, so, so in this project, I'm the only Haskell developer, so I'm the only one using the REPL things, for instance. But uh, whenever I work at a company, basically whenever I work, I, I write these and people like using them because it makes their life much, much simpler. Okay, I have a question then. Uh, what do you do with front end? Is it started uh, like this or do de developers don't run the front end locally? I don't do front end. <laughs> <laughs> I let them deal with their mess. So. No, I don't know. They use. Everything except front end, right? Yeah, exactly. So they use Webpack and whatever they use. So. I have no idea how it works, so I'm not even attempting at helping at all. Sorry. Oh no, that's not true. No, no, I've done it before <laughs> for, for a different company, but it was, it was very tricky to get right because most of the time their editors are very tightly integrated with the build system, and so it just breaks everything for their editors, which is a, a common theme in many languages, actually. All right. Thank you very much for listening. Don't hesitate to find me at the end. Oh, no, it was a clap. Great. <laughs> <laughs> Bye.